The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent, including Olas Media. Olas Media. Bring me out of my room one day and they have it all set up. Plastic on the floor and like there's a meat cleaver and, and there's Alexia pulled out of the bag on the floor and they proceed to dismember her and I have to watch. You know what's really awful is that I felt nothing, but I haven't felt anything for a long time. I think that was my only way of surviving everything is I kind of like played it off like it was a movie happening to someone else. And I still do that to this day. Like, it's easier than to make it like it really happened to me. I am Anne-Marie Schubert, and this is Inside the Crime Files. Welcome to Inside Crime Files with Anne-Marie Schubert podcast. I am Anne-Marie Schubert. This podcast takes listeners inside and behind the scenes of the investigation and the prosecution of some of the most horrific and notorious criminal cases in California history. This podcast also examines some of the most unique cases, sometimes with most unexpected endings. Today, we're going to talk about a horrific murder and child abuse case that happened in Sacramento County, California, in the mid-1990s. That case is called People vs. Larry and Barbara Carrasco. And my guest today, and I'm honored to be joined by Jessica Rial, FBI agent Jeff Ryan, and prosecutor Marster. So I want to first off, I welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining me. And let me start off um, perhaps with Jeff and Marv. And I'll start with you, Jeff Ryan. If you and I have known each other for a very long time, probably going to age myself by saying how long, but yes. maybe, maybe give the listeners a little bit about your history, um, the types of cases you handled when you're with the FBI, and, and, and just a, a sense of what you did with your career. Well, briefly stated, my uh, first office uh, of assignment was to the Chicago field office, after which I transferred to the Manhattan, New York City field office for, I was there for 11 years. And then after that, uh, we came, Lori and I, my wife, we came here to Sacramento. For most of my career, up until coming to Sacramento, I worked white collar crime, organized crime. Uh, I also worked some fugitive stuff in, in Chicago. And uh, also with new agents, you always end up being on uh, what they call Title Threes, where you listen with the ear earphones on. When you see them, these people sitting with earphones on, that's usually a new agent. And uh, so when I came to Sacramento, uh, Lori and I were experiencing a, a catastrophic illness with our older son, Joe. He survived. He's fine. But it left us with a real appreciation of and concern of children uh, suffering. And for me, the thought of a child suffering at the hands of a stranger or, or someone who means to harm them was pretty much unacceptable. So shortly after I got here to Sacramento, we had a, a seven-month-old baby taking in an armed home invasion. And I worked with the uh, Sacramento Police Department with their detective, Greg Stewart. And four days later, we recovered the baby and arrested the people responsible. And the FBI, like any good bureaucratic organization, started assigning me everything that had to do with that. And to my surprise, um, I, I found it to be my thing, my niche, if you will. Um, I can't describe, i just very emotional about it all. And then uh, one of the, in the mid 1990s, the director was Louis Free. And Louis Free tasked the FBI to get involved with local and state investigators in helping to identify and locate children. And along with that, we started working other uh, cases, all cold cases where the child had not been recovered and cases that were happening. For me, in the Sacramento area, I also became very, very close with a lot of the local law enforcement agencies. And for purposes of this case, it was with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, and their, what, their missing persons detective was named Steve Hill, and Steve and I developed a very close relationship, and Steve would call me every time the Child Abuse Bureau or Homicide would get a missing child, 
And in this case, I got a call at the office from Steve saying that they had a, a small girl missing from the South area and uh, could I come and help? And, and from that point on, I helped with the case. So, so before we kind of get into the, the actual case, um, you know, you and I have known each other probably 25 years at least. Um, and if my memory's right, you know, you, you worked a lot of pretty high profile cases and, and perhaps for the listeners, uh, one of those cases was the Carrie Stainer case, right? Well, people call it Yosemite case, Carrie Stainer case. I'm credited with getting a confession from a serial killer who was Carrie Stainer, who was responsible for the murder of four women in and around Yosemite National Park, which occurred beginning in February of 1999. And then he confessed on July 24th of 1999. And from that point on, uh, the, the case involved preparing it for court and everything. He's currently on death row. So, Marv, um, let me just kind of tee this up. I, I came to Sacramento DA's office in 9, August of 1996, um, and within a couple months, I was assigned to your unit, which was the child abuse unit, and you were my boss. But maybe you kind of tell listeners about your background, you know, your tour through the, the profession of prosecution, that kind of stuff, types of cases you handled. Sure. Sure. I, I was a prosecutor for 34 years, um, the last 25 in Sacramento, the first nine in Orange County. And uh, a lot of my career before I was stupid enough to let myself get promoted to upper management was uh, spent doing child abuse cases, um, supervising the child abuse unit, trying a lot of cases. And uh, I would say the last... 15, 20 years, I did mostly homicides, and uh, a lot of those were child homicides, unfortunately. And um, so child abuse has always been uh, kind of a calling for me. It's it's not something every prosecutor wants to do or enjoys doing, but uh, I always felt like it was where I needed to be. So a lot of my time was spent there. And uh, um of course, this case came in during my time as a supervisor of the child abuse unit. So there it was on my plate. Yeah. What year did you retire, Mark? 2014. Okay. Oh. So as this, so uh, you talked about being the supervisor of child abuse. Maybe kind of tell the listeners, what does that mean to be the supervisor? What's your, what was your job? Well, I had seven lawyers who did nothing but child abuse cases, which could either be physical abuse or sexual abuse. Um, they each had, uh, caseloads anywhere from 15 to 25 cases, which is, uh, a very large caseload for child abuse. You know what that was like. Um, but you, you have to take as many cases as come in. You can't turn them away because you're overworked. So, uh, these cases often go to trial. They probably have the highest trial rate of any unit because defense attorneys think they can win these cases. And, uh, you know, it, it, sometimes it was hard finding lawyers who wanted to work in child abuse because it can be a very punishing assignment, very difficult emotionally and physically. Um, but I got some great lawyers there, you included. And, uh, for the people who came there, they realized that that's why they became a prosecutor in the first place to defend children. Um, and I spent four years in Orange County doing it and seven years doing child abuse cases in Sacramento. So yeah, that was a lot of my career. Yeah. yeah. And it takes a toll. I mean, it's when, when we talk about child abuse, uh, you know, it's not just physical abuse and some of that we'll talk about today, but it's also sexual abuse. And, and sometimes there are crimes that are unspeakable. One thing the unit teaches you is that it's hard to believe what parents will do to their own children. Well, and sadly, Jessica, as I kind of introduce you, that's kind of what we're here to talk about. And I, for, let me first start by saying I am so honored that you're willing to do this with us and to talk about what happened to you and what happened to your sister. And, um, and, and so if you're okay with it, maybe you can kind of just tell us a little bit about, I mean, first of all, this all happened in Elk Grove, California, right? Yes. So, yeah, well, just uh, start off with how did you, how did, who was in your family and how did you end up in Elk Grove, if you remember? We moved a lot of places growing up. My mom moved us everywhere, wherever there was a new job or a new boyfriend. And 
I don't know, six, seven moves into my life. We ended up in uh, Rancho Cordova for a little while with my grandmother and my two, well, my younger brother and my younger sister. And then she informed us she was getting married to a man she met. And then we moved in to live with Larry. So your mom's name is Barbara, right? Correct. Okay. So tell us about your siblings. Who, who was in your family? I have a little brother, Chad, who is now, what is he, 31 or 32. And then I have Alexia, who is deceased. And then I have another younger brother, Michael, who was given up for adoption shortly after birth. So he didn't live with us or didn't have any part of How was she or how old was she? How old was she at the time of her death? Um, she was five. Okay. And how old were you at the time that this went on in Elk Grove? It was from when I was 12 until 13. Okay. So maybe, um, let me start off by asking, you said your mom, you know, Mary went through a lot of men, I assume, and ultimately decides to marry this guy named Larry. Yeah. How long were they dating before they got married? I have no idea because she was never really around. My grandmother raised us. So she would just find us a new place, a new place to rent and she'd be gone and come back once a month just to take my grandmother grocery shopping. So I don't know what she was doing or who she was with while she was gone. She wasn't much of a mother, right? Fair to say. Oh no, we were, she was only a mother when it benefited her to either get like welfare food stamps or to look good in front of somebody like, oh, look at my children. But the actual parenting part, that wasn't her thing. Okay, so you move into this home in Elk Grove and can you just kind of walk through like, how did this all, how did this whole case happen? How did it start? You're 12, right? I am. I am, when we first started moving, living with Larry, I was in sixth grade, so I had to switch schools and start going to school in Elk Grove. And my grandmother lived with us with my brother and my sister, and things were fine for a while. I mean, normal for me, like my mom was in the house, but she wasn't parenting. I don't really even know. I think she was always kind of on drugs. It's just, they become more prevalent once Larry had an accident and he was home full time. So I don't know if she used his injuries and his narcotic use from those injuries to help her cause, but it just went downhill from there. They both started using and there was no getting out of it. What was their drug of choice? My mom, meth. I guess Larry did too. I, I don't know. I never really saw him, but I'm assuming that's what he did it with her. So, Marv, you, I'm sure you can attest to this. It, sadly, in our child abuse unit, we saw a very high correlation in these types of cases with, with methamphetamine and other drugs, right? Absolutely. There's almost always drug use in the background of a child abuse case within a family. So, tell us... Um, before we kind of get into what happened to you and your sister, I mean, tell us about your sister, Alexia. As she you was quiet. She was a tiny little girl. Um, I don't know what she would have become because obviously she wasn't allowed to explore her full potential. Once my grandmother was removed from the home, it was just me and her, and I took care of her the best I could. Um, but I know she wasn't who she should have been because she hadn't didn't have exposure to other children um, or like toys or anything like that. She was just she's quiet and sad. Like honestly, she was lonely. I don't know. Um, as my mom's rule of thumb, as long as she didn't have to pay for anything or drive me anywhere, I could do what I wanted. So I guess if I could have made my way to the friends or, but we had what we needed. I was in school, wasn't deprived of anything. My grandmother took care of us, but come towards the 
end of my seventh grade year, right around, right before I turned 13, she started with thinking we were possessed and that she was God and she was very paranoid, trying to figure out who was trying to get her from messages in the newspaper. She would read them upside down and swear she, somebody was speaking to her. And it just got worse and my grandmother didn't like it. So she fought back with it. And they, she kicked my grandmother out. And then after that, all hell broke loose. Um, I barely went to school for the rest of my seventh grade year because I had to stay home and take, to, take care of Alexia. And it just progressively became more physical and emotional abuse over that summer. Because she was being abusive towards Alexia. She always singled her out. I don't know what it was about her, maybe because she was the smallest and didn't fight back. But she would always do things to her, ignore her, push her, pull her hair. And my grandmother wasn't having that. She's like, you can't do that. And Barbara's like, well, I'm their mother. I can do what I want and you have to leave. Because in the beginning, I thought Larry was a pretty decent guy. He went to work every day. He had a decent home. Like, he was just a normal everyday guy. And then over that summer, he started believing her delusions too. And he wasn't as physically abusive as hers. Hers were just like, whenever she felt like it, there was really no trigger for her. Him, when he would be physically abusive, it was when we were deliberately going against him. He used his size to force us to into what he wanted us to do. My mother nailed our windows shut and unlocked our doors so we couldn't get out because we were possessed. And so our helpers or our demon friends couldn't get in. I don't know where she thought we were going, but she also thought I was sleeping with Larry's um, brother and that I was pregnant at 12 and she called their family up and made all sorts of drama for them. She would only let us out when it was convenient for her. When I was in school, it was only like at nighttime because I had to go to school because she didn't want to get in trouble by the cops if I missed too many days. When we moved to Rancho Cordova, Alexia was probably three and a half, maybe four. She actually wanted to parent that day and she made a bath for her, but she made it scalding hot and put her in it and wouldn't let her out of it, even though she was screaming and crying to get out. She had mild burns all along her backside. And any, anything would trigger her. She'd pull her hair, call her derogatory names. Towards the end, she was locking her in the master closet, taped to a chair. I don't understand why she would do such a thing. I mean, especially to an infant, she multiple times offered her up to other people. I remember we went to a like a ranch. My mom was looking at a horse. She wanted to buy a horse. I don't know where she was going to put that horse, but she wanted one. But the woman who owned the place was having trouble conceiving and was looking into adoption. And my mom was like, well, here, you should take her. And I really wish she would have just left her there. It would have been so much better. She was only a few months old. But it was all, all just a game to my mother. I think if she could have got something out of it, yes, she would have. I never told anybody. Not a, Didn't breathe a word of it to anybody. I think I was more afraid of what would happen if I went home and nobody believed me. So I just kept my mouth shut. Because she told me the cops were part of the, you know, the bad people and they're not going to help you. Nobody, you know. And she just for years put into me how worthless I was and how I wasn't going to amount to anything and nobody would believe me anyway. So I just kept my mouth shut and went home. Michael had always lived with his adoptive father in Pennsylvania. Um, she gave him up as soon as he was able to fly after he was born. So he was probably, what, six weeks old. Um, and then Chad, she had sent him a few months prior to the su this summer to live with the same guy that adopted my youngest brother because apparently in her mind the boys were not possessed and they were going to be the saviors of the world and they couldn't be near us so they weren't there for the most horrific parts of it uh, one day i came home from school and i couldn't find alexia and she was crying and she was in the master bedroom closet taped to a chair legs and arms bound while my mother was cutting all her hair off because she said she, well, chink bastards don't deserve beautiful hair. And since you can't take care of it, I'm going to cut it all off. 
while she's crying and begging for her not to cut her hair off. So I don't know exactly what Alexia did to piss her off that day, because obviously I wasn't there, but it could have been nothing. It could have, who knows. But either way, being tied to a chair and having all your hair cut off wasn't appropriate, appropriate discipline. She was on a mission to rid us of our demons and save her unborn baby because she swore she was God pregnant with Jesus. And we were sucking the electricity out of the walls, killing them. And I, I was like, all right. Um, but they, she came up with that uh, we should drink bleach milkshakes three times a day for eight days to help rid us of our demons. It would basically an exorcism. The first time I refused to drink the, the milkshake because I wasn't going to do it, he followed me into the bedroom and punched me in the eye. And I had a lovely black eye for a couple weeks. Um, and then after that, he made sure we drank them. Like, so I didn't refuse after that. I was terrified then because he's so, so much bigger than me. And the first few times, first like day and a half, I was able to get her away and help her throw up. But after they figured out that we were doing that, they kept us separated and locked me in the room after I drank my milkshake um, and then forced, you know, I don't even know what other torture they did to her after I was locked into that room. Um, but then I wasn't able to help her anymore. Alexia didn't really make it to the eighth day. Um, from what I remember, I think it was like coming of the eighth day is when she passed away. Like we didn't get all the shakes that day. I remember being let out by Larry from the hall, my bedroom into the hallway. And Alexia is in the bathroom in the tub. And there's like a red enema bag in there too. And she's just laying in there. I don't know. I can't really tell if she's moving or not, but she was making noises. And then Larry brings me out, makes me sit and drink my shake. And as I'm finishing up, Barbara's like, yelling for Larry saying that she's not breathing. Uh, I think she's dying. And then she lays her on the hallway floor, leans over her, uh, does a half-ass attempt at CPR, realizes she's dead. I swear she smiled. And that was that. No more bleach. Like, I guess she figured, well, we rid the demon. We're good to go. So I didn't have to drink the shakes anymore. And they just put her body in a trash bag and put her in our freezer. I, I saw all of that. I saw she was lifeless on the floor. And once they, well, once Barbara thought there was no attempt in, like she wasn't going to be saved, they just, Larry got the trash bag from the garage. They put her in one of those big black contractor bags. And I was made to follow around. I had to follow them around because it was always, well, this will happen to you too if you don't listen or if you don't do as you're told. So I was following around and they put her in the freezer for a couple days until they decided what to do with her. Uh, a couple days go by, it's normal. They're trying to be nice. Like still they're doing their drugs and hanging out in their room all day. So I don't see them much, um, but I'm not locked in a room. And then they bring me out of my room one day I have to follow them into the master bedroom and the master bedroom closet. And they have it all set up with like papers and plastic on the floor. And like, there's a meat cleaver and a saw and all these different equipment. And there's Alexia pulled out of the bag on the floor and they proceed to dismember her. And I have to watch. They didn't tell me why I had to watch, but they told me what I should say if anybody asked where Alexia went. And that if I didn't do as I was told, I would end up just like her. So I'm assuming I had to watch because they wanted me to know that this could happen to me as well. So I learned that story and I stuck to that story of her being in Chicago with her father for a very long time. Once, I honestly, it's awful, but I didn't think you could dismember a body that small in inside of a closet. Um, I don't know if it was her aggression or what it was, but there was, it, she was... There was no solid mass left, basically. And they put it all in a trash bag. We went out into the living room. He lit the fireplace. And handful after handful, we just burned her. Um, that evening, we went to the Sacramento River and the ashes, along with all of the 
utensils were thrown into the Sacramento River. For probably a good month after that happened, they tried. Like, she was nice to me. We didn't have as many derogatory comments. Um, there was food in the house. Like, things were as normal as I guess I could expect them. I still wasn't allowed to speak to my grandmother or really go outside, but it wasn't daily abuse and neglect. But then it changed. I, I started eighth grade and just started all up again with the demons and the vampires and we were just starting the whole process all over again. I think they did come out twice for like um, welfare checks because my grandmother called. But I lied to them each time they came and said everything was fine. Lexi is with her dad in Chicago and we're good here. You know what's really awful is that I felt nothing. But I haven't felt anything for a long time. I think that was my only way of surviving everything is I kind of like played it off like it was a movie happening to someone else. And I still do that to this day. Like I'm working on it in therapy finally, but it's easier than to make it like it really happened to me. Um, one night I'm sleeping and they come to my room in the middle of the night, wake me up, tell me it's time to die, demon, take me out to the shed. And they, I've slept in there before. So I was like, okay, this again. So I went out there, took my clothes to get ready for school the next day, had my alarm clock the whole bit. And I go sleep on the lawn chair and I wake up to them Larry pouring bleach all over me to exercise my demons. And then I fell asleep with bleach all over me. I couldn't change my clothes because I didn't want to ruin my school clothes. So I just slept laying there in bleach covered clothing. And he comes in a couple hours later and they hose me off with a, a hose. And then I go to school the next morning. And I went through the school all day. I didn't tell soul, didn't tell anybody. But I told a, one of my friends at lunch, she's like, you know, you really should tell someone because you can't go home to that, that. So by the end of the day, I was so worked up, I finally did tell my last period teacher uh, that my parents threw bleach on me and I couldn't go home. Um, and then I, at the end of the night, I was left at a receiving home, which I didn't even know what that was, where I had to, once again, take another shower. They marked all my injuries and booked me and that's where I stayed for many, many months. I uh, received a call from Steve Hill, who was in the uh, Child Abuse Bureau and, and basically telling me that they think they had a missing uh, child, that the child's grandmother had called the Sheriff's Department to do a welfare check. And when they went there, they believed something was really wrong because Alexia's face had been cut out of all the pictures around the house. And they also said that they weren't able to get uh, any kind of information from anyone that everybody kept saying she was in Chicago with her father. And uh, so we started going with them. I had my partner, Bill Nicholson, was with me. And uh, we started, uh, you know, just doing what we normally do, background, things like that. Um, and then I learned that Alexia's older sister, Jessica, was in the receiving home. And I believe that Jessica had to know something and that the lack of what we knew was just too much to, to accept. So Bill and I went over to the uh, child receiving home. It was on Auburn Boulevard. And uh, we uh, were permitted to be in a room with Jessica. And uh, <clears throat> I pretty much did the interview. And, and we basically, when we started with Jessica, she was, you know, she's in Chicago. Jessica was very, very angry, a lot of profanity. She hated us, hated us. And, uh, but I just, um, I, I needed to know, I guess, I don't know. Uh, so instead of asking questions, I started asking Jessica to, to introduce us to Alexia, to tell us all about her life with Alexia, to talk about how Alexia was cared for. And what came out of it is that the only one 
that cared about Alexia was Jessica. And Jessica was like her mother. And as we started going down this, this path, I could see that Jessica was starting to break down. And I made a choice to continue. I should say that I looked for Jessica for 25 years after this to apologize to her. And um, from my interview, I caused Jessica a lot of emotional strain and uh, anguish, hardship that I always feel bad about. But Jessica, once she accepted that she was the only one left who could speak for Alexia, she told us everything that had happened. She told Billy and I everything that had happened. And once she did this, we had an idea of, of what needed to happen. We reported it immediately to Mona Fjord, who was the case detective, and to Steve, and to the Child Abuse Bureau. Um, the receiving home where Jessica was was not happy with me because um, we would not let them into the room while Jessica was in such a fragile emotional state, but uh, we needed to know what happened to Alexia. And then uh, as soon as we informed the uh, the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office, they, they rallied around Mona and they started putting together search warrants and we started going to the house. And uh, the first time we went to the house, we found that there were numerous graves of dogs in the backyard. And with our inability to locate Alexia and with what we had heard from Jessica, we were very concerned that there might be parts of Alexia in the dogs. So we, we uh, recovered all the dogs and we searched inside them looking for pieces of Jessica. The coroner, the Sacramento County coroner was there as well. It took us uh, several days. It was one of the worst crime scenes I had ever experienced. But the bottom line was um, we didn't find anything. And then we started facing the reality, you know, she's got to be somewhere else. Jessica had talked about the fact that she had been brought to the closet frozen and dismembered, burned in the fireplace. And Jessica talked about the tools and whatever was left from the fireplace being thrown into the Sacramento River. So we started going down there. And uh, Jessica remembered that while they were at the Sacramento River uh, dumping all that stuff, that they had locked themselves out of their car and had had to break one of the windows on the car. So we really did an extensive review of the parking area and we found a spot where there was a lot of freshly broken glass and we figured that must have been where they parked. We called for the county search and rescue and they brought divers in and uh, the divers were unable to locate anything. So then uh, with the inability to locate her in the river, we then went back to the house. And by this time, the FBI, because of our director, Lee Free, we were actively helping and we were using our laboratory resources to help. And um, also in Sacramento County, um, they had an evidence technician named Faye Springer, who's just a very, very much an expert. Yes, famous. Um, and she was just remarkable. So to uh, not go on too long, we went back to the house. I will tell you that um, in a personal sense, I was extremely angry. And every time we went into that house, their burglar alarm went off. And uh, I think it was like the fourth or fifth time we went back, I had had enough. And I had just bought in a uh, law enforcement um, knife from Steve Hill. Um, and uh, I just cut every wire to their alarm so we would never have to hear those noises again. I have to say that uh, just listening to Jessica and Jeff has, has brought back a lot of terrible memories. Um, it's a, it's a tr very tragic situation, and uh, you, know, you think about that little girl and the life she never got a chance to lead, and it, it just breaks your heart. But... Uh, getting back to the narrative of all this, I was sitting in my office and uh, Jeff and, and someone from the sheriff's office, I can't remember who, I guess it was um, Mona came in and presented the case. And at first it was just a child abuse case, 
uh, with Jessica as the victim because we didn't know about the homicide. So we were we were talking about um, what had happened in the shed and the bleach being poured over her and reporting it to her school teacher, and that's how it all started. And it stayed that way for a while until Jeff and the sheriff's department were able to get uh, more information. And that primarily came from Jessica. Um, they did spend a lot of time digging up the backyard. They used ground penetrating radar, as I recall, uh, because they were concerned that Alexia was buried back there. But there never really was any physical evidence that really assisted the, in the case at all because they had covered everything up so well. Uh, there was clear evidence that they had um, changed the carpet in the master bedroom closet. And there were signs that the, the bleach had been used <clears throat> on the concrete there. Um, and, of course, the pictures in the house that law enforcement found that where Alexia's face had been cut out of the pictures. And, of course, that she was missing and nobody knew where she was. The FBI went to Chicago and checked with the natural father, and, and he said she had never come to live with him. And, uh, the grandmother had never seen her anymore, so it was pretty clear she was gone. And um, then eventually it turned into a homicide case. We filed the homicide charges. Uh, I, I remember several times going out to the receiving home and uh, taking Jessica out, and we would go to lunch and just talk about the case and talk about what was going to happen. And, um, and that went on for a few months. Um, Barbara and Larry each did make statements to law enforcement, but they lied pretty much about everything. Barbara would blame Larry. Larry would blame Barbara. Um, uh, and uh, there still wasn't any physical evidence. We, we had a missing child, an older sister who told us what had happened, and that was about it. And uh, it came to trial eventually. Uh, Larry's trial went first. We did a jury trial for Larry Carrasco, and he was found guilty of second-degree murder. <sighs> Jessica testified she was my primary witness, my primary evidence, really. I mean, I was able to prove other things. Uh, as Jeff told you, we had the glass from the parking lot, which corroborated her story about locking themselves out of the car that day. And we actually were able to prove that the the window glass that they found came from a model of that same kind of car they had. So that was actually fairly substantial corroboration of Jessica's story. Um, and uh, jury did the right thing, found him guilty. Judge did the right thing and gave him a maximum sentence. And then we moved on to Barbara. She pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. One of their defenses was that bleach wouldn't kill anybody. So she must have died of other causes. And there was never an autopsy, so how do you know what she really died of? Uh, another was Barbara. If anything happened, Barbara did it. I didn't. I was just there along for the ride, essentially, was, his, was what he was. He didn't testify, so um, they kind of attacked what I presented instead of presenting their own defense. But this... These are the kind of things the defense attorney argued. Um, then there was uh, not, I'm not responsible for what happened because I was in a methamphetamine-induced psychosis most of my time. So I wasn't really aware of what was going on, and I was just an innocent bystander to this mess, if anything happened. But of course, in any no-body homicide, just like this one, their primary defense is, you haven't produced a body, how do we know anybody really died? They presented very little evidence. They just simply uh, said that, th that you couldn't believe what we presented, that Jessica was not a reliable witness. Of course, she was. She was a very reliable witness, and I, I couldn't have won the case without her being reliable. Um, so as, as often happens in many homicide cases, they don't really present their own defense. They just attack what the prosecution proves, and they hope that that's enough to convince a jury that there's a reasonable doubt. Barbara goes to a court trial with a different judge, no jury. Uh, her primary defense is, I was insane, so I'm not responsible for anything that occurred. And the defense attorney and I, I think it was Bart Wooten from the public defender's office, uh, we agreed on the judge, 
and we agreed to submit the evidence through transcripts from the Larry Carrasco trial. So I didn't have to call Jessica or any other witnesses this time. We presented everything via transcript, and the judge simply read the transcripts. And uh, Because insanity was the big issue. Where we pr- called witnesses, both sides called witnesses, were the, sh- the, the psychologists and psychiatrists. It was a battle of shrinks, and uh, I guess my shrinks did a better job because she was found guilty. <clears throat> the judge rejected her insanity defense, and she also received a life sentence. Barbara Carrasco, who really was the moving force in this, Larry uh, Larry did enough bad things, and, you know, the, but Barbara was the one driving the bus, <laughs> uh, to use a metaphor that's appropriate given what Larry's job was. And uh, so she orchestrated everything to hide what they were doing, including lying to everybody, lying to the grandmother who, who started all this in motion by re, by reporting to SSD that she thought something had happened to her granddaughter. Uh, they, they did everything they could to cover this up. They did not act like people who were insane, who, you know, don't care what happens because they don't recognize good and bad or evil or anything. So, it, she clearly was sane. She clearly knew what she was doing. She clearly knew her actions had killed a little girl, and she did everything she could to cover it up and escape responsibility. Unfortunately, in this case, the criminal justice system ground her down and and dealt with her appropriately. I've never heard from Larry once. Um, I used to write Barbara when I was like 18, 19, maybe into my early 20s. It was really good therapy just to tell her off. Um, and then eventually I grew out of that and told her, don't ever contact me again. And I, besides the hearings, I have not had any contact with her. She's still crazy. Um, she's never, I, I mean, I don't think she'll ever take full responsibility. I think she will eventually just get out because. She'll be so old, they'll just release her because they think she's not a threat anymore. But she's never going to just say, yes, I did it, and I did it because I hated her. Like, And that's really what it is. Like, She admitted finally that she did never want us and she hated us. But she still blamed someone else. I think this most recent one, uh, she blamed most of everything on my grandmother. And that's why she had all the actions that she had because she was angry at how she was raised. Is any of that true? I have no idea. Um, Because my grandmother's not here to agree or disagree with any of what Barbara is now currently saying. Well, uh, you know, I I, I think I've spent a lot of time in, in child abuse and heard so many cases. And the one thing that always, uh, become so sharply in focus for me is that drug abuse destroys families. And I've heard people say that drug abuse is a victimless crime, that people should be allowed to use drugs and it doesn't cause any problems except for themselves. But the reality is that drug abuse is present in almost every serious case of child abuse that I've ever seen. And believe me, I've seen a lot of them. And uh, so what I would hope people would recognize here is that it, this case is the most horrific example of how drug abuse destroys families and children, and people need to recognize that. Well, what I want people to take from this is, for one, to remember Alexia, because um, there really, there's nothing, besides a few photos I have, there's nobody alive anymore who can celebrate the what life she did have. Um, But another thing is I want people or children who are in a situation like I was to know that you do not have to end up just like your parents. It's a choice. It's hard, but you can do hard work. You can overcome and you can become successful. I'm educated. I have my own business, own my own home, have three beautiful children. I have all of these things that Barbara told me I could never have or achieve. And I've done that mostly on my own free will with very little help from the system or anyone else. But I want people to know and kids in my situation to know that they can do that too. They don't have to end up back in that same cycle.
um, for the listeners out there. Um, I hope you keep listening to these podcasts. You can find us on InsideCrimeFiles.com and listen to more about the true consequences of crime and the innovation and inspiration that comes out of these cases. So I just thank you all. Olas Media presents Inside the Crime Files. Olas Media.